following preview was begrudgingly approved for all audiences. You're listening to Elevator Music. Welcome back to Forward Thinking, presented by the Professional Collegiate League. I'm Ricky Vellante, and I'll be joined by my co-host, David West. As usual, we'll be talking about those challenging the status quo, doing social good, and bringing about positive change to the world, while also talking a little bit of sports. In this episode, we'll be joined by Dr. Kendall Jasper and his brother Kanan Jasper to continue our conversation around mental health and wellness. Then we'll be joined by former NBA player and current Beijing duck, Ekpe Udo, to discuss his life in professional basketball and several critical transitions he's had during his career. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and also at the PCL YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more information, check us out at thepcleague.com slash forward thinking. We hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back to Forward Thinking. We're now joined by Dr. Kendall Jasper and Kanan Jasper, better known as Doc and the Dude. Thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you for having us. For our viewers and our listeners, I think the best place to start is just to tell us a little bit about your background and the work that you guys have been doing in the, in the mental health and wellness space. So I am Kendall Jasper, as you said, licensed clinical psychologist, been in, uh, a psychologist, licensed psychologist now since 2004, originally from Brooklyn, New York. I have a background in athletics, being a former college athlete, so a background in pretty much all facets of mental health. I've worked residential, I've worked psychiatric hospitalization, and let's see, 11 years ago, we decided as a family to open a community mental health agency, born out of my private practice. And uh, ARJ, which stands for Acceptance, Responsibility, and Judgment, was born. So ARJ, since that time, has expanded to having offices in North Carolina, South Carolina, and in New Orleans, Louisiana. You know, along with providing community mental health care, my athletics background has led me back to also providing services and doing consulting and programs for the NBA and the NFL, such as the Rookie Transition Program, some of the team meetings. It's sort of being on call when there are issues, very much doing the same for the NFL as well. So, and Nike, and I'll let Kanan speak a little bit more to some of our affiliation with Nike and, and some of the different travel AAU basketball teams across the country that we've done some work with. Yeah, so piggybacking off of what Kendall said, he definitely came with an idea of wanting to start our own thing. He said, because currently the way mental health is being addressed, it just really wasn't talking to us in the way that was effective. You know what I mean? They would send him on like almost rogue missions when when something happened with a person of color or it was dangerous. They would send him out there to try to talk people down and, and get them off the cliff or whatever. And then they send him back to the same protocol that wasn't working for them to begin with. So when he came to us, he was like, he came, I think he came to me first and he said, look, we could do this ourselves. And I was like, we, and he was like, yeah, you know, cause we need money. So <laughs> as a family, um, we came here, <laughs> we came together and, you know, put some dollars together. And then once, once, you know, I'll be perfectly honest, being involved in it at first was a fiscal decision, but once your money is involved and money is involved, you start paying more attention. And then you start seeing, wow, this is a world that I totally knew nothing about and forces you to get closer. Now you, you're all in. You have to learn it. You have to dive into it now. I'm participating in the offices. Now I'm learning more about therapeutic methods and spending a lot more time with him. And him being a doctor, me being right there next, next to him, I'm learning a lot at a very fast pace, which thrusted me into that business too. So we came up with a, a unique hybrid program that addressed things from a clinical perspective as well as a regular person because I could say things, very real stuff that he, you know, he may, might be you know, a little bit limited on. And so those standardized protocols that you guys previously dealt with, part of what you guys have been doing is taking a little bit of a non-traditional alternative methodologies to reach not just, you know, again, that standard standardized protocol setup. Uh, yeah. Could you go a little bit into those yeah. non-traditional methodologies? Well, well I, I think that, and I'll take a page out of my brother's book. So there are a lot of non-traditional things that are going on, right? Technology has put us in an age of 
sort of non-traditional communication, non-traditional access to information, non-traditional interactions with each other. So we have to respond to that and things are fast moving, right? And and I am not your, you know, to, to speak about me personally, I am not your traditional doctor licensed psychologist, right? I grew up in with crack in the 80s in East New York, Brooklyn, who very much thought that my way out, even though I was getting educated and my parents preached that, I thought my way out was just like every other black kid from the ghetto. I was going to get out of here with my athletic prowess, right? This is going to take me out of here, right? I get a free pass in the neighborhoods because I'm good at sports. They recognize me. Leave Kendall alone, right? He's got a future with football, basketball, baseball, whatever he's going to do, you know? So I find myself taking a non-traditional path. And then I realize, listen, not everybody is made for the traditional come and sit on my couch and talk. First of all, from a cultural perspective, most black folks not going to sit on anybody's couch. Your right. grandmother don't even want you to sit on her couch, <laughs> right? So why the hell am I going to sit on some man's couch? In most cases, that looks like a middle-aged white man or white woman, right, to talk about what my issues are. Believe it or not, what you come to find out when you get this far into it is the therapy process is what you make it. Right. And and we, me and the person or or us and the, the people that are sitting across from us dictate within certain parameters what that process should look like. Right. We we right? show we show up anywhere. Like we we've we show up on your block, we show up there's often times where we gone into certain neighborhoods and then we ended up turning the situation to into group therapy because more times than not, if a person is infected, then that area is infected. You know, you can't treat a person and send them back to a, a sick environment. So if, if you are in a, in a city somewhere and we need to show up, we show up and then we turn it into what it, what it needs to be. To meet you where you at, whether it be the basketball court, whether it be the golf course, whether it be wherever it may be, we, we'll show up and we'll meet you where you at, make you, you know, feel comfortable. And then we'll, we'll find a, a common ground there, you know, but it will be, Life based. It won't be a, a straight clinical situation. And, and and it's just not, you know, before we transition, and, and, and it's just not, you know, in low income situations, right? right? So when we go in the room, or if I go in the room and I'm working with an athlete, right? I don't want to just talk to that athlete. I want to talk to everybody around the athlete. We, we all play a role here and we all have a significant impact. And they also need to understand that there are real life consequences for the things that are done. And there are lessons that are involved. Listen, there's certain things you can't participate in. They don't want to meet you. They want to meet him. Y'all can't be in the car together riding around with, with, with weed and smoking because if y'all get bagged, the, the headline doesn't say, not to mark you, the headline doesn't say David West homeboy got caught with weed. It says David West got caught with oh, an ounce of weed in his car. So let's all talk about how we're going to support each other through this journey, right? And all the things that come with it, isolation, depression, fear, anxiety, the pressure of succeeding, the pressure of telling no to your parents and your friends, how to ward off leeches, so to speak. Because, you know, what we've come to find out is we all experience those things. There's not a person walking this earth that doesn't get depressed, doesn't get fearful, doesn't get anxious and they manage it in different ways. And for some individuals, it becomes more intense than others. So let's recognize it, acknowledge it, and then figure out a way to deal with it. What are some of the ways that young athletes can potentially recognize or know, you know, start, I might be in a mental health crisis. So what are the, what are some of the signs young athletes should, should look for to identify? Well, I think that isolation is definitely one. Okay. Right. I, I think that, and and that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean isolation or feelings of loneliness when you're by yourself. You can feel lonely and you're in a, you're in a crowded room with people, right. right? You know, athletes are big on routines, and they're they're very big on getting into routines that lend themselves to their success. If we see a break right. in your routine, right? If we see a break in your sleeping habits, if we see a break in your exercise regimen and your eating habits, mm-hmm. if we see a spike in your irritability. An inability to express yourself without having some form of an outburst, right? 
or becoming somewhat more recluse, that's a sign and a signal. Relationships. Yeah, I was uh, about to go there. No, like, you know, your, your, your relationships are changing. Absolutely. Yeah. People have the biggest misconception, and you can speak from personal experience, but they automatically think that once athletes aspire to a certain height and experience a certain level of success, that right. the world becomes a perfect place for them. Right. No, they, they are, their world is, is, is not any different, and it may be at times a little bit different because there's more pr- pressure associated with that success. I'm, right. I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump in from a, you know the taboo conversation, overindulgence. You know, a lot of lot of cats. You start overindulging. You, you know, obviously substance abuse could be one way, but right. even, even opposite sex. You know what I mean? If you're a professional athlete, you pretty much been, if not famous, you've been focused upon since you probably was around 11, 12 years old. Right. That's when you started separating yourself from the pack. And people have not been the same or treating you with truth since then. By the time you become a 19, 20-year-old person, you have no idea the agenda of who's in front of you. So every game is, every interaction is a guessing game. You don't know if this girl really likes you. You don't know if, if this dude is really your homeboy or you're just a crutch for him. You don't know if this relative really needs help. You, you, right, you don't right. know any of these things. So you start overindulging in coping mechanisms. You know, I see a lot, a lot of cats like, oh, I got this chick over here, I got this chick over here, I got this chick over here. Well, you right. know, you have, you have five different situations that you got to be five different people to. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then it becomes very challenging for you to focus on the task at hand. That that's a sign too. You know what I mean? He was like, all right, what what am I doing over here? I can't and then now your accountant is talking to you like, yo, what what's really going on? Why why right. is this happening? Why and then now you start hiding things because now you're somewhat embarrassed and at the end of the day and then Lord help you you get tied up with somebody right. who you know you shouldn't be tied up with. Now you on a hook for eighteen years plus. Right. So so there's there's a lot of things that that happen that are tell signs. So a lot, a lot of our young, you know, we, we interact with a lot of young athletes and stuff. I'm like, yo, slow down, Slim. Slow down. Right. Trust me, that girl, when she leaves, she, <laughs> she's in somebody else's DM. You know, right. she knows right. everything right. about you. She knows everything to say to make you feel comfortable for that time. Trust me. Right. You know, that's a dark room you're going into. I've always I always asked that question because while I was in the league, we didn't really start focusing on mental health till like 2012. Mm-hmm. So that most of my career was done. That was already nine, nine or ten years in before we even got the first team colleges, and that was in Indiana. And even then, a lot of the conversation, you know, it's always that taboo just around if you, you know, if you talk about mental health and you look, you seen it soft, you know, when I was young growing up, you know, my coaches were like, now nah, you just deal with everything. You get hurt, you deal with it. You know what I mean? You, you somebody up. score on you, dunk on you. Yeah, you just man up, you deal with it. So, I mean, I, I felt the challenge of it because I was kind of on that fence of trying to figure out, am I being soft because, you know, I might be obsessing. You know, when I was in New Orleans, I used to obsess you know, overbeating certain people and to the point where, you know, it was drive. I couldn't folk. I, I couldn't wait to play against somebody. Like, so for instance, we didn't beat the Mavericks my first three years in the NBA. And so I remember like literally just go having these episodes where I'm like on the edge. I'm like, yo, I got to, you know, cause Dirk Nowitzki at the time is like the standard at the power four position. I'm like, yo, I got to get through this cat. And it was, it was driving me crazy. It forced me to, sure. like, I'd be over fouling. I'd be like, you know, going too hard in practice. Coach like, yo, you got it. And I didn't realize it until years later. That's what I was dealing with. Like I had this, this anxiety about trying to prove myself. So I think it's good. You know, anytime athletes can hear like what those signs to look for are really, really good because um, the stigmas, and this will be the ne- part, next part of my question, is what are the stigmas? Like, how do, you, how do we get rid of some of those stigmas around mental health and, and the taboo around? I, I would say some of what we're doing now, right, because having a conversation about it, talking about your vulnerabilities doesn't make you weak. It just makes you strong and it makes it, it, makes it known, right? So it's right. truth telling. So if it's the truth, I can't get embarrassed about what that truth is. So if you come later to me and you say, this is your truth intent to embarrass me, 
guess what? We already crossed that bridge. Everybody knows that. Right. Come with something different. What's interesting about what you said, though, is I tell athletes this all the time. The same resiliency that you show on your playing surface, it, it doesn't stop once you're in the locker room or at home. In a basketball game, you could turn the ball over, get back on defense, get a rebound, come down, shoot an air ball, come back, block a shot, come down and get a dunk. Right. Right? So you've had success and failure in a 50-second period. Right. Those failures didn't stop you from getting back and preparing yourself to be successful with a rebound, a block, and then a dunk. So how do we transition that into your real life? Because the same tools that it takes to be successful there are the same tools you can use to be successful off the surface. Part of that is about the preparation. Part of that is about what you would call your film study on self-reflection, knowing yourself studying yourself, understanding what your triggers are, understanding the, the environments that you're most successful, right? And continuing to be in those environments and then maybe work on how you transition to success environments that you're not that very successful. Mm -hmm. One, one right? thing I'm, I'm going to add to that, Kendall spoke about understanding who you are and knowing your truth. One thing that's very obvious about athletes is their size and how people deal with you because of your size and how you want mm. people to perceive you. You know what I'm saying? You six, you, you six ten, right? Six left. No, six ten. nine. Six nine, yeah. Six nine. There's no way you hiding in the room. There's no way, right? So people already have their assumptions about who you are, what you do, and what you should be like. A lot of athletes, they they shy away from their truths, their size. You know what I'm saying? Like one of the reasons I love Shaq is Shaq never apologizes for his size. Right. You know what I mean? If Shaq want to get on the floor and break dance, he going to break dance. He'll be just a seven foot two, 350 pound break dancer. He right. going to do it. You know what I mean? Right. But that allows him and everybody else to feel comfortable because that's really who he is inside. A lot of people start, you know, deviating from who they are because of their size and it basically self-inflict some trauma on you because now people are reacting to your insecurities. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have to teach athletes or that we do tell, talk to athletes about is being comfortable with your own self. Six, nine, do you six, nine? I know that chair is made for a five foot eight dude. You know what I'm saying? Right. Don't sit in it though. <laughs> like, right. you know what I'm saying? Hey, like, hey ca careful, bro. I'm five, nine and a quarter. You ain't got to throw five, eight. Uh, that's like the height of man. Careful, big time. Right. Like, what you, you know to what do, I bro? mean. You know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> like, but you got to impress. Man. I mean, you got to really put the emphasis on who you are and becoming comfortable with that. Because right. it makes the entire environment much yeah, better. That's, but that's, but that's, how you get, that's how you get through the stigmas, right? Obviously, there's stigma associated with mental health. And that's what makes people shy away from going to see someone. Right? Nobody wants to be thought of as crazy. Needing to, needing to be on psychiatric meds. We always, the first kind of vision we have of someone that has mental illness is someone in a psychiatric hospital, you know, restrained to a bed or in a straitjacket. Mm. That's the imagery. If you go on social media right now and you look at some of the sites that highlight mental health awareness, it's someone looking disheveled, right? Hair all over the place, right. not looking like they have it together, right? So that just perpetuates that imagery perpetuates the stigma individually you get a you get away from that stigma by being comfortable with who you are mm. right their perception of you wh whatever a person's perception of you is their perception of you you have to manage who you are and even if you want to be perceived in a certain way not everybody's going to perceive you in that way so ultimately i have to be comfortable and figure out a way to be comfortable with who i am acknowledging my strengths, my weaknesses, my vulnerability, and, you know, figure out a way to, to, to overcome and be confident in that space. And then I, I get away from the stigma. Listen, I, I battle depression. What does that mean? What's your perception of me understanding that I deal with depression and anxiety? Also, right? That's a question you ask somebody. Yeah. Also, be careful on who you're taking your instruction from. Just because somebody claims that they're in a space I'm in mental health. I'm in it. Listen, you have to take validated information. Start with knowing the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. There's, you know, they're two totally different things. 
One is a medical doctor. One, obviously, is a clinical doctor. A lot of people don't know that. So mm-hmm. people say, I'm feeling a certain way. And the average person will say, oh, you need to go see a doctor. You might go need to see a psychiatrist. You may not need to go see a psychiatrist. Maybe you need to see a therapist. Maybe you need to see a clinical psychologist to help you understand your thought process more. Because for me, I'm not taking advice from a patient. I don't, I'm not, I don't care how much you believe in something. If you don't have some skin in the game, some experience, some evidence-based findings, you know, I don't want to take too much advice from you. That's like going, you know, getting accounting advice from your mechanic. I'm not doing that. See, and, that, and that's where, that's where Kanan and I disagree a little bit. And I understand where he's coming from because there's a lot that I have learned from some of the patients that I've treated through their behavior, through some of the things that they've said. I have learned some of those things, not that I necessarily took advice from them, but I've learned from them, right? But what I will say to to him is that, listen, we come from a sports family, so we compete, right? And we're very competitive, as most athletes are. I have guys that I play with and against that are and were pros. And I get in these discussions with guys who weren't pros who want to then call those guys that were pros. And I'm talking about NBA pros bum, right? right? And and I jump and I jump all over them. And I say, look, fam, if you never played at his level, you can't call him a bum. Because I have seen the guy you calling a bum, the fifteenth guy on a bitch, come out here and give somebody thirty he will give you eighty, dude. <laughs> right, right. Okay? He will give you eighty, son. So in the same sense, I didn't come this far and and call myself a doctor and have a terminal degree for someone then to say, You're not qualified to do this. Or then try to get at me in a certain way. Not that I'm above reproach, but listen, fam, we we not you not where I am. You know, let's have a little bit of deference and let's have the conversation in a different way. And you also have to realize it's very dangerous for you to be giving advice to someone yeah. and not understanding the liability associated with it. And until you've dealt with a situation where you've been on a call or you've been at the hospital and a patient of yours has committed suicide. And you realize there was nothing really that you can do about it, but you still have to live with that. Until that happens, what are we talking about? No, I, you know, I, I that gets my motor running. You know what I mean? Like I, you know, I watch cats. Nah, uh, I know, told him. I said he was five nine. That got his. That got his. Motor <laughs> <laughs> nah, no, listen, I, listen. But I was all right though. You know, what he mean? Was. you know, I, I could go get it a little bit. You was you little know, little like, guy. You was little guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna give a dude a shout out though. Mark Hedgerson, right? Mark Hedgerson went to Kansas State, right? Mm-hmm. We played, we played Kansas State, and my big man Demarco Johnson made it to the league, right? And I love Marco, but Mark Hedgerson was a, him and Marco was second round draft picks, right? And they was like, "Yo, right. this guy's gonna be a pro." Mark Hedgerson gave us 37, <laughs> like whole. All of these. And I'm like, man, what in the world is going on out here? Like, right. before the game, you're like, nah, this dude ain't no pro. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, he a, he, he a little different. He hitting a little <laughs> different. Like, my, you know, my pro track is like in Turkey or, or <laughs> Iceland. Right, right. My man, my man <laughs> lacing this thing up, up. You know what I mean? Right. Or to be explicit, just because this is something else that David and I brought up with our other guests, is that especially when it comes to youth athletes and youth athletics, what it sounds to me like you guys are saying is that the mental health and mental wellness component needs to be taken as seriously as the physical condition of athletes because the whole athlete is what's performing on the court, not just the physical person. Absolutely. I mean, you know, all of us being former athletes here, we understand that there's a time that separates the men from the boys. Usually... That happens up here. Up top, right, right. And there are things that are often ignored. Like, all of us have heard that. Yo, just man up. You know what I'm saying? Tough through that. I need you to be mentally tough. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? How? When I'm, oh, now I'm mentally tough. <laughs> right. You know, you ain't, you're not teaching me how to practice and make this thing practical for me. You're not doing that. So until we have very practical things that somebody can implement in my everyday life that now I could relay these on-court things and these off-court things and and, and weave them together or off-field or on-field and weave them together, I'm not going to be maximizing my output. These, especially now, these athletes are far more fragile, not because 
of potential is because mm. they're distracted. Mm. They're distracted when we right. we had no choice but right. to uh, draw the lines between fantasy and reality. Right. You know, you still had to practice. Your coach could still grab you up, you know, and right. you understood his intention. You weren't falling apart. You know what I mean? There was a distinction between athletes and dudes who weren't. So a lot of times the guys who weren't athletes, as my brother said, they'd be like, ah, right, yo, this ain't for you. You got, you got to go over there or right. you go that way. We pr They protected you. Now the lines are so blurry. These kids, you know, you, you playing ball and then – your gang, you know, you in a gang too. But the other part of that is, and Kana kind of alluded to it, and this is not necessarily psychology, this is just observing and also being in the basketball circle. Who's coaching these kids? Oh, right. right? Everybody on, on here has had a good coach who has taught them something about life, right or wrong. Right. Yeah. Right? Because most good coaches understand life. In order to be a good coach, you got to understand life to a certain degree because you got to understand how to how to treat people, right? How to interact with them, how to hold people accountable, how to hold yourself accountable, help them become responsible young men. It's chaos out there. Any and everybody's coaching these young men. You know, you you watch and you're like, how are they allowing these kids to get away with what they're getting away with, <sighs> right? The, the level of emotion that they're showing, right? The inability to manage themselves, to organize, to think through difficult situations, to quit in the moment on their teammates and their team. What are we doing? Allowing one kid to be so selfish that the other kids are pretty much statues. That's not, that's not any game. And it's not just limited to basketball. But, right. you know, you, you have to understand that we're preparing them for success because the majority of them will not have the success that they're looking for on their playing surface. And what are you going to do then? How right. do you transition into something else? And How do you have the confidence and the courage to say, you know what, I'm going to put this down in this moment of self-reflection. I recognize that this is not for me. It's not working out, but I'm not a failure. Mm. I'll just what? take up a new challenge and make an attempt mm. to succeed in, in something else. I remember one time we went into it was on the on the trip and, and uh we went to Georgetown. We were able to go in John Thompson's office and he had a deflated basketball in there. And I'm referencing the basketball because that's the thing I know most about. Yeah. He had a deflated basketball in there and his question was big hands. <laughs> he was like, What are you gonna do when the air runs out? And that was a very a scary statement because who who are you outside of this? And what are you doing to like you you go to practice for hours, work on your physical and stuff like that. But how are you strengthening yourself? How are you becoming more educated, more aware of your surroundings, more aware of the subtle hindrances and in, in, might I say enemies that right. are in your circle? How how are we real really gonna deal with the truth that I gotta be five different people going to and from school, you know? So I basically gotta be a controlled schizophrenic, you know, going to and from my house just to make it home safe. And then I gotta perform when the whistle blow and everybody wants me to make it. How am I gonna deal with these things? That's the things when that air runs out. And very few people are prepared to tell have these conversations with these young men and women for that matter. Right. And, and right now, most of these most of these uh, guys, they have not even been in in a space where they can take critique from a grown man. Yeah, yeah. So, how yeah. do you expect to learn those and overcome those challenging moments if you can't take the critique and experience that somebody who with experience is trying to give you? You don't know how to even receive it. So, right. absolutely needs to begin at an earlier stage. I would say as early as. Middle school. I would say earlier than that, Kay. I probably would say now, especially with most youth sports moving to getting younger to start to train on that one mm -hmm. sport, whether it's baseball, football, basketball, tennis, soccer. Most of these kids, second and third grade now, are getting intense with focusing just on one sport, which is something I don't necessarily agree with. I prefer a 
multi, multiple sport athlete over a one sport athlete any day of the week. And that has something to do, I think, with brain chemistry and your, your physiology and working different parts of your brain to excel and right. problem solve and execute along with the motor skills and the muscle memory that it takes to strengthen your entire body, right, including your brain. So there's some science to that. But we have to start at an early age managing and dealing with adversity. And sometimes kids need to be told, listen, you lost because those kids were better than you. Yes. Right. And, yes. and guess what? And guess what? If you want to become better, use that as motivation. Go work. Right? <laughs> we don't get we're not out here giving out participation trophies to everybody. Yeah. Right. I think I think what you're talking about really is, is a microcosm for what our society has kind of evolved into. Because if you notice, like, I mean, even at the presidential level, right, like our press, our president, he I think he had a press conference yesterday. He just walked. They can't he can't handle people with a, with world level power, can't handle being questioned, can't handle right. being critiqued. And that's one of the things like I know, like the coaches that I played for when I was young, they would almost probably be in jail now. I mean, they yeah. couldn't. They wouldn't be allowed. Now, these are men. I mean, these are former ex-military people like my dad was, like, just didn't play. Like, it wasn't a matter of, you know, you having to say, well, I don't feel like it. We could, we weren't even allowed to articulate that stuff. And you experience that now, right, in, in, in grassroots basketball, which I'm heavily involved in. This is to your point earlier about loving yourself. If you ask a college coach right now, most college coaches in the country will tell you that they are very skeptical of recruiting seven foot guys. And I asked one of them one time, why? He said, because most seven foot players, they're the most insecure people mm -hmm. in the sport. The tallest guys are usually the most internally insecure. And then he said, the second thing is they've been forced to play and haven't developed a real love for the sport. True. And, you know, you end up finding like, so, and I always feel sorry for him. And I don't even know if it's the right thing, but how many times have you seen a big seven foot kid and you're like, man, Right. What happened, right? Like what? Right. All I, the time. Right. And to me, a lot of that is what you're talking about. If somebody was able to get to that kid when he was in, when he was 11, when he was nine, right? When he's standing head and shoulders above everybody. But, you know, I used to have this thing where I would slump over as well. And my aunt had to smack me in the back of my head one day. Like, yo, if I ever catch you doing that again, it's going to get, it's going to be worse. And so I, I understand what you're saying with these kids and having to reach them early because particularly with the bigger kids, I mean, it's a struggle getting them to just love themselves, embrace yeah. the fact that they got big hands. Like I had big hands, big feet, man. I wore a size, I've been wearing a size 17 since I was in seventh grade and I didn't grow until 10th grade, man. Yeah. So <laughs> you're talking about dealing with, <laughs> dealing with all kind of stuff going to school. <laughs> You know, it's just, it's just what it is. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you guys are, are doing the work that you're doing because I think that another major part of it is this distraction piece. And that's what I want to ask you now. So how do you work? And this is even for the pro athletes because I was in the Warriors locker room and Steve came in one time and he lost it because I'm from the old school. Once the game start, my phone is off. But like this new age of guys, you know, every time guys go in the locker room, it's in their phone. They looking oh at Twitter. They looking at what people are saying about their performance in the first half. And it's it, it becomes a distraction. So what, what, do you, what would you tell athletes now to deal with the distraction? You know, sometimes that pulls them away from from their their ultimate focus, which is, you know, on court performance. But the biggest thing is boundary setting. So we're big. Right. I Obviously, you know, what RTP is and Ricky, you probably right. know as well. So it's a rookie transition program. Every year I do the RTP. I get 13, 18 rookies come in the room. You got the NBA, NBA Players Association. Rex Chapman came last year and talked about his opioid addiction. You know, it was it was great. Well received the whole nine yards. But we talk about. What, is, what your NBA life is going to look like. One of the biggest things we talk about is time management and boundary setting, right? What, what boundaries are you going to set for yourself to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. And you need some help, but you also need some discipline and you need to understand that you need to allow people to hold you accountable when you are crossing over that line and stepping all over the boundary that you set for yourself and they have set for you. And we can't waver on that. And it has to be a question when you get that old. How successful do you want to be? Because right. if you don't, if you don't accept what those boundaries are, and if you continue to step over them, if you're a perpetual line stepper, then guess what? Success is probably not on the horizon. And you you have to live with that, 
right? That's that's what you have to own. You know, not everybody's going to get that. Also, what I'll tell you is that you have to establish a destination. Again, certain experiences uh, allow you to, to do this. But again, another trip we went on in high school, we went to the Boston Celtics practice. I, I lied to you not. Barry Bird literally practiced going from a catch to a triple threat position. He probably did this for about an hour straight on the side. So when we got a chance to ask questions, he was, we, you know, I asked him, I asked him, why, why, why were you doing that? So he got one of our guys, he got up and he, he passed him the ball five times. Five different times, dude was in a different position when mm-hmm. he got, came into the triple threat. He said, look, I'm, I'm not the fastest guy in the world. He said, I, I don't have, I'm not having time to think about where the ball is where, when I catch it. I already have to have memory to where I need to go with this thing. And catching the ball and getting it right in my hands is not one of the things that I want to think about when I'm mm. about to do my thing. So putting that in real life, he made something a practice, a habit, because he had a destination. So if you have a destination, you simplify the, the choices. Is something going to be helpful or harmful getting me to this destination? Even if, So to the point where it's, it's down to even picking up my phone. Right now I'm in a locker room. Is this helpful or harmful? If it's one or two things, it's an easy question. You think this is helpful? But when I got to go play this game, nah, put right. it down. It, it's harmful. You simplify the situation. You make that a practice. Now it's something you don't even got to think about because it's in your routine. And you're like, all right, right now I'm on this destination and this don't fit over here. So putting this now. Unfortunately, what I will say is that even with that being said, because of changes to athletes and the response to it, Mm -hmm. we're probably going to get to a point where they're probably going to allow some of that to happen and they're going to be time limits on how often you can check. Right. Right. So Cliff Kingsbury he comes to the NFL. One of the things that he institutes is he allows his guys to check their phones. He he has phone breaks uh, okay. for them in meetings because he recognizes that he's dealing with these millennials. Right, right. And if it you know, if you can't beat them, join them. So the other part of that on the opposite end of it is everybody has to adjust. Everybody has to adapt to what's going on. Because as you know. You may lose the guys. And if you lose the guys, they're the most important commodity anyway. So we've got to figure out a way to, to kind of compromise and say, okay, well, maybe during games we won't do it, but maybe we'll have some breaks. You know, game time is, is all about our focus and being locked in. So before and after, we're going to institute this policy, and that's, that's how we're going to manage it. Right. You know, when we're in film sessions, we're going to break. We're going to allow you to to engage in that process because I thought what he did, you know, made a lot of sense because he recognized I'm dealing with a group of 19 to 22 year old guys in here. And that's all they know. It's become, you know, it's easier for us to put our phone down and not look at it because right. we live during a time when they, have one. Oh, right. <laughs> right, right. they haven't. So most of them, since they were three years old, three or four, they've been sued yep. by some form of technology. Some of that is about, being able to compromise and understand it's checkers and not chess. Chess, not checkers. <laughs> chess, not checkers. I'm sorry. Mm. Appreciate the pickup, big bro. But <laughs> at the foundation of it, we should always be working on how we manage ourselves, our emotions, right? If we can, the choices that we make, the, the consequences of that and being able to live with them and understand them, right. you know, and also recognize that a lot of times what prevents us from engaging in a behavior or having an opinion or, or doing something is we're concerned about what someone else's perception of what we're doing is going to be. And that limits us. Mm -hmm. I'm so concerned about how you're you're perceiving what I'm going to do. Even if, even if it's for me and my health, I'm not. It took, it took literally, it took me watching Carl Malone to start shooting jumpers in the NBA. Like I had a coach had to come tell me, yo, you got a completely wrong view of how this thing is going to go. And your career is not going to go the way you think it's going to go. If you don't change. And I'm like, Cause I had been bred like you a big man. You got to score at the basket. You got to score right. in the paint. But the reality was I wasn't big enough physically and strong enough physically when I came in the league to do that. So it took me literally like I said, okay, I got to accept the fact that I'm going to have to shoot 15 to 17 foot jump shots that make right. a career for myself. 
And I can't worry if somebody says, oh, man, you floating out to the perimeter. Man, I can score at the basket, but I'm only 225 pounds right now. Shaq, 315. Absolutely. And you know what I mean? These are, so it's crazy what you're saying because a lot of times we find ourselves just adjusting. And in, in my case, it was, yo, you need to change the way you literally play and you can't worry about how people are going to perceive your game because you need to create a career for yourself. Destination. Yeah. You're at a, you're at a destination. And thank God you, you know, you developed that. That probably gave you an extra six years on your career. What? Man. You know what I mean? Like an extra 10. A, 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 <laughs> mid, a mid range, a mid range is like an apple a day. Right, right. <laughs> right. Me, boy, I'm a, I gotta ask you something back at you, man. How do you feel mentally about right. some of the numbers that these dudes are pulling down when they have not like, I'm like, you don't even have good level of perfection at any point of the game right 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 you know do you think that is helpful or harmful to the younger generation coming up good question so i think it's harmful because what i find is that guys are chasing the perks so all these perks that come with right making the nba and being successful so they tend to focus on the perks and so when you see guys i outlasted guys because i was like to hell with the fame and the fortune I got to have real production on this floor. And the impact that I leave on a team has got to be far beyond just a highlight. It's got to be on the court, the intelligence of the team, on-court performance, the toughness of the team, how sound we are in the locker room. Those are the things that I would allow to sort of follow me around the NBA as I took on my journey. I don't think that guys now understand that because we live in like this clip society from social media, you got guys who are overachieving and put, getting put in places that they shouldn't be. Some guys fall victim to it. Some guys adjust. Some guys figure it out. Some guys, you know, the worst thing that guys deal with in coming in the NBA is getting attacked. And I think one of you guys said it earlier, from the time you like nine to you 18, 20, everybody said, oh, you the greatest, you the greatest, you the greatest. You get in the NBA and you're facing this 31-year-old man who's during the second, you know, second to last year of his deal, and he knows he has to have a really good game. He has to dominate you, and he goes at you. I've seen more careers in that way than the other way. Ah, so I think that guys end up seeing the perks, seeing the reward, and they overlook the work that's right in front of them. And oftentimes they end up getting caught. That's why you end up with a team like ours where in Indiana we had one McDonald's All-American. Everybody else was – Ranked 200, ranked 300, not, you know, Lance Stevenson was the only All-American we had on the whole roster. Wow. Uh, yeah. Paul George wasn't All-American? No. Paul George actually was told he wasn't going to play in the NBA. Yeah. We were told he wasn't going to make it. Wow. Because, again, he was a taller guy. He wasn't embracing playing inside. Right. But he ain't right. no big man. I got it. Yeah, that team yeah. That's a tough, that was a tough. Yeah. But again, it's like, it's that, it's that question of when you see, you know, I, I, I listen to all these people talk about how the mid range, right. Is a bad shot taking, you know, mid range jumpers is a bad shot, but it's hilarious now because we're watching this last dance thing, right? <laughs> all we're watching is Michael Jordan be successful hitting literally the greatest player hitting mid range right. jump shots. Right? right. So it's always this thing of like perception versus reality. Yeah. Right. It, right. I, you know, tell these young cats all the time, like, yo, if you think you're getting 30 alone on offense, you're sadly mistaken. You right. need some steals. You need some putbacks. You need some breakaway. On offense alone, that is damn near impossible to do that. And, and you're going to burn out. Right. When, when it matters, the team, that, that defensive coach has a scheme that's designed to stop you. You better understand what you're dealing with. And it's only 24 seconds on that clock. So you ain't going to get as much time as you think. Well, Kendall, this has been a great conversation for our listeners and our viewers. Where can they go to learn more about you guys, check out more, and, and follow you all? Our social media <laughs> handle is at Doc and the Dude, D-O-C-N-D-A-D-U-D-E. I got to pull up his Slack. Baby. You know, what are you doing? <laughs> you, and, and our email is Doc and the Dude one at gmail.com. Dot com. <laughs> now you can say dot com. <laughs> on an email, bro. And you guys are also syndicated radio, too? You guys have some reoccurring appearances there? Oh, yeah. Yes. We do some stuff on, on like, uh, Sway in the Morning, uh, Breakfast Club. Want to then- hustle out of Atlanta, Didi in the Morning. You know, and we, we're starting our personal thing that we'll be beginning. We'll be shooting some episodes this week off the rails. And we, we talk about an array of issues. And we got real-life 
people, real life situations. You know, I know everybody right now is live. Everybody live with the right. celebrity thing. Some of our friends happen to be celebrities, but most of the time, what we getting at is real information from real validated people, and we can relay it. And hopefully, it's it's good shareable information that's going to help. We'll be putting out information starting this week and hopefully you guys can help us share the work absolutely i got one more question for both of you guys morning morning routines what 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 kind of morning what is the first thing you guys do when you hop up in the morning first thing for me before i move at all before i get out of bed some sort of breathing routine right right through their nose, slow out through the mouth i try to get at least between 30 seconds and a minute in you know before you do anything because Breathing is a very good detergent of of thoughts that of clutter or a lot of things, you know. So before you start receiving things, you got to clear some things. It just, you know, it's not enough room. That's that's my daily before when I morning and before I go to sleep. Good deal. For me, when I, when I wake up, I usually engage in in some form of a quiet meditation, and it doesn't last very long. Usually, like a minute and a half for me, two minutes max. And then I will get into the notes in my phone and kind of accomplishments for the day, short term, long term accomplishments for the day, even down to the very simple things that we don't think are successful for us. But if we've accomplished something and we've set out to accomplish it, then we're training ourselves to complete those tasks and then acknowledge the success associated with completing even the simplest tasks because it's good practice for you. I try not to have more than five to 10 things on that list to accomplish and work through them and then go back to it, kind of remove it from the list. And then also just from a, I think that it's very important, believe it or not, we get up in the morning, should at least have one or two glasses of water. Right. There you go. That's my, that's my first thing. I, I, I chug, chug about 16 to 20 ounces of water as soon as I wake up. To turn yeah. my body very on. important. Yeah. Very important to drink some water. We underestimate how important the simple things from a mm-hmm. nutrition standpoint Right. As Ricky oh. drinks some water, I got you, Rick. See? <laughs> and I, and I, I stretch. I stretch. I stretch. You know, occasionally I'll get into a, a form of a kata or something, but I stretch for sure. You know, I maintain heavy flexibility. And more times than not, people don't understand it. You don't get sick. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't have those ailments when you work those kinks out. And fortunately enough, I've been pretty healthy. Well, we appreciate it, guys. It's been awesome. Thanks, Thank fellas. You, we appreciate the time, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having us, man. And we'll I'm be quite, back at I'm y'all. Quite. Thanks for joining us here on Forward Thinking. David West, Ricky Vellante. We've got a special guest today. NBA player, current CBA player, Ekpe Udo. Uh, number six pick, right? Michigan, Baylor background in college. Welcome to Forward Thinking, FK. Appreciate y'all for having me. And that's accommodating. Um, Absolutely. I want to start with, you know, just for our listeners, get a background of yourself, you know, where, you, where you're from, a little bit about your, your early basketball career, and then ultimately the steps you took to where you are now. Yeah, so my, my whole name is Epidemic Friday Udo. Both my parents are Nigerian. Right. Both from Nigeria. Dad came over first and mom followed my older brother. They settled in Edmond, Oklahoma. That's where it all started. Signed a uh, student visa. For my dad to go to school, a church did. And okay. He's been with ever since. So that, that's been my stomping ground. From there, grew up, won a state championship, went to college at the University of Michigan first. And at first, I didn't think I was going to go to college because I, I didn't get my ACT score. So I was actually thinking about going to prep school route. So I was actually still playing, like, spring basketball my senior year. Okay. And then, I, you know, I, Got my ACT score and was able to go to University of Michigan. First year with Tommy Emmerich, and he got fired. John Beeline came in. He was a coach. We were terrible. It was just a different change. And I wanted to get back closer to home. And that's why I decided to transfer. We had some choice words and some conversations that I'll never forget. And, and Baylor ha- took that year off, you know, due to NCAA rules. Right. Came out that you're on fire. We were able to make a make a run to the Elite Eight, lost to Duke, and realized my dream, got drafted uh, by the Warriors, sixth pick. And I was with the Warriors, Bucks, Clippers, 
went overseas a couple of years, which I, I would say changed my life because I was able to just, you know, get outside of the American bubble. Right. Uh, just had to sit down and deal with right, myself. Right. So that was cool. Came back, played with the Jazz for two years, and now, now I'm in China. Good deal. What was that transition like from Michigan to Baylor uh, for you as a as an athlete? It, it wasn't too bad because one of my one, one of now he's my best friend. He came with me from Michigan. He's my manager, agent, all of the above now. So he came to Baylor with me, and I knew a couple of the guys that went to Baylor before I got there. So that was cool. Sitting out the year, that was tough. Uh, with the guys, that that was definitely tough. But the adjustment, I think, was more so probably the university size. Okay. Was like you said, Michigan is 30,000 plus, and then Baylor is like 10,000. The cities were, were, were different. So that, that was the biggest difference for me. I know you mentioned it, and I, you don't have to – to go as deep, but how was that coach's reaction when you made the decision to go from? And I'm no, only I'm asking not. you because of who the coach is. So I just want to know what that was like, you know, making that that choice, and what those conversations were like. Yeah, you know, man. To keep it to keep it straight, I'm glad what happened to him happened. Yeah, he said some things. He just said something to me, man. That so we, I, you know, I was meeting with him before he granted me my release, and he was like. You know what? I'm gonna sign this release, and then like in a couple of years, I want you to come back and we'll see what you made of yourself. Wow! And I, I, I was stuck. Like, yeah. man, I'm a college kid. <laughs> you know, like, right. how are we gonna go about it? And I just left out the meeting. I, I told I told my circle that I was there, and of course, they was off a of beeline from the rip. And then, you know, three three or four years later, I pulled right back up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, got a meeting to a secretary or assistant, whatever. And as soon as I sat down, he just talked the whole time. I really didn't get any words in. And I, hey, man, all, all I needed was for him to see me. Right, <laughs> right, right. I got you. Yeah, I think sometimes these parts of, you know, the athletic journey sometimes are overlooked because I never had to transfer, but I did have to have some tough conversations. So what was it in you that allowed you to have that tough conversation, you know, face that conversation with that coach alone and making that decision? Man, just my circle that, that I relied on. Wow, you know, when I, Detroit is like my second home. So my first yeah. year there, one of my teammates, Deshaun Sin, he was from Detroit. So we would be back and forth and I was able to, to make this group of friends and I, I would rely on them. I'll do the decisions and the year that we just had and going forward, and, you know, it just knew, it knew it was my time. And then I knew at the same time I would have a year off, you know, to, to work right. on my and, and get ready to make that splash. Because when I transferred, I didn't want to go to, like, a, a mid-level D1. I wanted to still stay at, at a high level. And, you know, so, of course, I could play at that level. It's just, you know, what happened just didn't work for me. So, you know, I just went to that meeting, 10 toes down, man, and just, you know, right. went into it. So right. I got it. You know, a lot of times when people – talk about transfers they try to portray it as though the athletes are are running away from a situation or you know unwilling to face adversity this may be a little bit of a leading question but do you feel like that's unfair of how athletes get portrayed during that process definitely i mean especially when you, you don't have a conversation with that athlete on why he's you know making the change it, it's unfortunate and it is what it is i mean i think at that point, for the athlete, you just gotta, you gotta take those lumps, take that year off, and then get ready. I mean, it's the time showing that you can play out on whatever level. Yeah, so as I sit here in my Cavs hat, a happier person today than I was at the beginning <laughs> of the season. <laughs> in other terms of transitions, you mentioned jumping from, I think it was from the Clippers, and then you went to Turkey, where you did extremely well, got a completely different perspective within basketball. Could you tell us a little bit about that transition as well? Man, that transition was uh that 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 was an interesting one. That that was definitely interesting because my last year with the Clippers, I was teammates with Tito Turkoglu. Bingo, I got you. <laughs> yeah, and, and he was, he was from Turkey, and yeah. just our conversations, and then you know trying to figure out who he was when it came to Turkey. Then after the season, whatever what happened, you know, we became good friends, and then the team that I, that I wanted to go play for, Fenerbahce, he knew the president of the club. They had that conversation, you know, I had a workout and then it all worked out well. And then first game I have in Fenerbahce, Turkey was there on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And it was it was special, man. It was special to to see to see that come full circle. Right. Uh, but for 
just to learn the game, you know, from Coach Obradovich, who's one of the greatest coaches in sports, learning from the European style was, was dope. It was great. To build that confidence back in your game, still play at a high level of basketball. You know, you just not, everybody ain't built to just go overseas. People think you just go overseas and right. just whatever you need, you're going to go dominate. And that, that's not the case. All right. How was that experience, you know, living, I know you're, you're, you're Nigerian by nationality, but you know, in your you lived most of your life in the US. So how was that transitioning to living outside of the US? It was tough because I was around the time where just this whole agenda on Muslims and, and, right. and trying to make them out to be a bad individual. So going there I had all all those stigmas in my mind. So mm. I, you know, I wasn't open minded. So the first six months I struggled. I, I didn't straight from the gym to the crib, eat, right back to the crib. But then as I started to open up and I started reading more, this is when I really started to get into history. You know, I just started to open up my perspective, man. And that's when I really started to enjoy my time on and off the court. Right. So before that point, how important was, I guess, learning? Because, I mean, experience is the best teacher. So you don't get to, I don't believe you ever really get to learn things unless you truly experience them. So what was it about that experience that sort of pushed you toward history more, maybe taking learning a little bit more serious? How was it in college as res in respect to what you were doing in Turkey? Well, I mean, I have Nigerian parents. My dad, okay. <laughs> he went to the University of Central Oklahoma when we was like elementary school. We used to be in the college library. Oh, wow. <laughs> Waiting on him to get done, or whatever. You just got uh, students uh, looking at us like, what are y'all doing here? Uh, we just been here. So my dad, oh wait, you know, basketball is cool for my dad, but that education and me getting my degree is what really put a smile on his face. Right. You know, so learning was always there. Did I take it as serious as I do now? No, nah, I didn't. Uh, I, right. I, I always did enough to get to get where I needed to, to go. But then once I once I finally got comfortable in Istanbul, I started just reading about history from the black black perspective. And that's when it really hit me. Then I started to pay attention to the black experience or the African experience all around the world, you know, everywhere I went. And and it was it was it was different. I was starting to open my eyes to, you know, the inequalities and, and all the ills that, that are going on. I just kept getting deeper in it. And as I kept getting deeper, you know, we grew up, I grew up in a Christian home. Mother's very religious, spiritual. As I started to get closer to history, all of that the faith started to leave me. Right. So seeing how it was used, you know, in religion, you know, to take over a group of people. So that, even though it was great that I was learning, I was, right. I was going, going away from my faith and not even dealing with it, like, you know, just because of what I had learned. How did basketball help you? Like, where does basketball fit in that context? Because I've always, like, I've had that struggle just dealing with keeping basketball in a certain context, but then understanding the reality that we live in. Okay. So how did, how did, how does basketball sort of help you in that, in that gray area? I think sometimes that we, we operate in. Almost like a sanctuary, somewhere right. I could get away and do what I love and push all that to the side. Once I come off of it, I come down from that high, I, you know, you go back into that space. But there was always a way, especially when I went overseas, because you go yeah. around in these different countries and you start to see these experiences. You see how crazy these fans are. But once you get on that court with your five, and, you know, you were in Europe, every game is life or death almost. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> so every game you putting it on, so you just going to war, really, every game with your band of brothers and soldiers, and that's what would, would take me away from it. Right. Is the atmosphere and those those fans, is that one of the, the staunchest differences between playing in the U.S. versus playing in Turkey versus playing in China, where it's just a totally different experience? In Europe, man, it, it's nothing. Those fans are the craziest fans. You can take, you can take college, you can take NFL, uh, NBA, MLB. You can put them all together, and you still wouldn't get yeah. there. Nah. You know, it's, it's almost impossible. And overseas as well, they overlook these things. Like these fans are really—you could say they're they're racist. You have racist fans, and I guess they don't really understand the connection between being racist and you know you having a black player, but then the black player on the other team—they say whatever. 
but then go rooting for you because you're on their team. You're making their life. Their club, the clubs over there, it's like that is their life, and they will literally kill you. I had a, a teammate of mine played in the Euro Cup years ago. It's probably like my third or fourth year in the league. And after we didn't make the playoffs, I went over to, to experience like the Elite Eight. I'll never forget it. I mean, the drums, all the instrumentation, it's just a constant, you know, just like, I guess, a constant cheer that's going on. I, I didn't even understand. I, I don't think I would be able to play like the way that I am, like cerebral, I stand side of my thoughts. I just felt like, damn, this might be a step too much. You know what I mean? Like in terms of, <laughs> in terms of the environment with like, you got like 10, 15 bass drums in the arena, people just beating them things and whistles and all kind of stuff. You know, we don't have any of that stuff here. So I just, I just always thought it was unique to see, uh, <laughs> to see and experience that. As serious as I would have, as I saw you throughout your career, I was playing against you. Uh, the moment something would have hit you in the head, like a cry, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you might have lost it. You know, yeah. uh, that, that was, that, throwing stuff was big, man. Yeah, like, I don't yeah. you remember, uh, well, one of my teammates, Defender Bacha, his name was Gigi Daytona. Okay. Yeah, I remember Daytona, yeah. Yeah, so we were playing one of the rival games. We were on the road. And in the, I think it was the third quarter, going back and forth. Next thing you know, he gets hit with an iPhone charger, the end piece. Ooh. He's bleeding from <laughs> the middle of his head. I'm talking, so they, they paused the game, went to the locker room. And, and, and once they paused the game, they just started throwing whatever on the court. Water bottles. They was throwing milk wow. on the court. They was going crazy. Paused the game for like, 15 minutes and just got on the fans and then we came back out and got the fans still there. Yeah, it's it's a it's a whole different, whole different experience, you know, playing over there. But I like I said, I think for the most part, guys who experience that, you know, obviously, you know, get to evolve in a way that sometimes, you know, guys who don't ever experience playing in those environments do. What what, what was the NBA's role? And again, I've always been, I've always sort of appreciated you from a distance. You know, because you you're willing to you know talk about reading and just not shy away from this other part of you that you know obviously in, in the basketball and the sporting world is not represented often, right? Like somebody right. who can articulate their thoughts, somebody who understands the value of education, somebody who's able to think outside these these really sophomore headlines. So, what was that experience coming into them? Because I know what my experience was like being somebody that was like I got hooked into history at like. 17, 18 years old. And, you know, when I got to college, plunged myself into it a little bit more, coming to the NBA and it's like, hmm, you know, I had I had some thoughts. So what was that what was that right. like for you? You know, it was at first I was just trying to you come into so much money, you know, right. you just living the life. So I really didn't get I really just wasn't reading at that point. My, right. my 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 guy would send me articles and different stuff and I would I would get it that way. You know, it's funny, we, 2011, 11, 12, I think it was the summer, Billy Hunter was fired. We were in Vegas. We were going MBPA meeting, and they had the three candidates to be the, the next president. Yeah. I think it was two women and one, one male. In that meeting, they did their spill, and at the end of every meeting, you were sitting. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. This is when I was like, "Dang, I wasn't really thinking about this type of stuff." And you, and you would always ask that question. Yeah. Well, now you ask that question. You know, what do y'all think about group economics, or how would y'all, you know, how would y'all add that to, you know, for us, for right. our benefit? And it was crazy because when you said like people were snickering on my side of the room because they didn't really understand what you was talking about. Like if you're on another level. And then to see like the the candidates, they couldn't really speak to it, right? You know? right. And then you explain, and I was like, "Dang, he is as serious as he is, man. He's very intellectual, you know." <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Like, yeah, I remember that. And yeah. looking back on it, it, the whole Billy Hunter style that that's, that stuff was crazy. But as I started to get more into it, and I started a book club while I was in Milwaukee, that was like my third year. And I didn't really start speaking out until after Turkey. Like, I, Turkey was what changed my life, you know, being able to speak out wow. and have the conversations. Because when I came came back into the NBA, when I was with the dad, we started reading different books. Like, last year, last year, we read the autobiography of Malcolm X. We read mm -hmm. a book, Heavy, by 
PSA Layman. But we were reading all these different type of books and having these conversations. And it, 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 to me, it was special because I was building these these communities. And if these were books that they never thought to read, right. you know, and I was, you know, I was introducing that to them. So it, it was special. And those are fans. Now, these fans that are part of your book club are from all over the oh, world. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, I, I carried it. Even when I went overseas, I had it. So this is some fun. It was just a way to interact with fans. But as it continued to build, uh, it just became, you know, these little communities that I would take wherever I went. And then last year, uh, Miss Obama shouted us out, and that was that, that was really a joy for them, for the fans and for myself. Right, good deal. Now you're in Beijing, as you, you mentioned at the very beginning. What's been your personal experience in, in dealing with everything that's going on right now and the overall interruption of sports? Man, getting to Beijing was the longest travel day of my life. I mean, left, we flew from L.A., me, me and the trainer, he's from the States as well. So we left L.A., I don't know what time. I just know we got to, uh, to Beijing at 4.30, I'm sorry. From the moment we landed for our layover in, in Vancouver, it seemed like life changed. Walking through the airport, we're starting to see people wearing the, the, the hazmat suits, goggles, masks, everywhere. From the moment you got to the gate, you had to take the temperature. You had to fill out these forms. You get on the plane. During the flight, it was like three times they came up and they checked the temperature. I had to wear the mask the whole flight. Buddy sitting next to me had the goggles on and the big mask. And I'm like, man, what, I, am I not taking this serious enough? Like, right. what's going on? And then when we land, the processes and the systems that we had to go through just to get to where we're being quarantined took almost 12 hours. Mm. That's how serious it was. So that was a journey. And then getting into quarantine, quarantine for 14 days, staying in like a, a dorm style room, not being able to take a step outside of your dorm room or they coming to get you. It was it was brutal for me, you know. And the whole time we thinking we're going to start playing April 15th. But, you know, you, you you trying to stay, you lifting weights in your room. I'm running door to wall, trying to do some type of suicide to stay. <laughs> just right, trying right, to right. Up. And then, like, the third or fourth day, they're like, well, we're sorry, but we postponed it. We postponed the season. So then all of that went to hell. I just said, well, I'm just going to relax, man, and just, right. <laughs> just breathe and relax. And then everything just get Kim postponed. We get out of quarantine. I posted on Instagram you know, how happy I was just to step outside. Mm -hmm. Those 14 days, that, that did a number on me, just with some things that were going on in my life and then having to actually sit down in a foreign land and, you know, deal with myself. So that, that was great. And then ever since, man, we've just been, just been practicing, waiting. And every, every day it seems like, uh, well, we might start the season here, then it gets pushed back. It's the every right. day like that and just waiting and then you know you see it all across the world with league different leagues and stuff in my opinion they should just cancel and just get ready for next every league should cancel and take the proper steps get the proper guidelines ready for next year because you start these leagues up and a couple players get it yeah. that's a head don't think any league wants to deal with right well i i think everybody's i don't know who's following who like i think everybody's waiting for like that first domino right. to fall i don't know if the nba is following the cba or the cba following the nba you know you don't know who's who wants to step first i you know i i, I kind of feel the same way you do i don't know if it's worth the risk you know what they're saying here now is that the nba is is, is leaning toward you know jumping for the playoffs but they don't sound like they're overly convinced that they Ooh. should do it so i just think everybody needs to be safe and be cautious man That's why not <laughs> you know why not i know it's a lot of money at stake but at the same time that these lawsuits could come that that could total a lot of money as well yeah and i think they're going to change i think they're going to you know obviously we, we talk about the way that sports may look afterwards with without any fans um what are they have you gotten any inclination about what your experience is going to be like if and when you guys start playing again over there so if we were to start back, say, next month, it would be two cities and uh, all the teams are for eight teams, eight teams in one city, eight teams in the other. Okay. Uh, you would probably play, like, from 12 on to whatever time at night. No fans, all type mm -hmm. of, you know, 
got to get tested when you leave, when you come back, you know, just strict rules like that. Right. Are y'all dealing with that now? Like as you go to practice and your daily? Are you oh, yeah. Well, in, in China, in Beijing, when you leave, you have to have a mask on. Every building you enter, either, they're, you know, they're taking it physically, your, your, your temperature or you're walking through to some type of scan. And then you have an app that you have to show that you have no abnormal you know, conditions. And they're on top of it. Right. <laughs> they're not messing around out here. And mentally for you, I mean, I can only imagine, what is that like kind of having to just constantly prepare yet not know when or oh, if you're going to go back on the court? It's tough, man. It, it, it's definitely tough. But I, I appreciate it because I know a lot of people, people can't really get to the gym. People can't really wait to right. you know, stay in shape. I, you know, I'm, I'm able to do that. And now I'm able to walk around, you know. In the states, you're not really supposed to, you know. But I, you know, I have my routine during this time when I was back at home. I really didn't have that routine, right. uh, so I'm grateful for the routine I have now. And you know, if it comes back, I'll be ready. If it doesn't, I'll, I'll be in good shape and be right. ready for whatever comes next. What What are your What are your If you were talking to a 16 year old kid, telling them about you know career choices, the path, what What would be some of your advice? You know, to a 16 year old who's you know on the fence about you know, which direction should they go into college? Maybe their idea if it's MBA or bus. So we have, you know, I'm somebody that thinks that guys sometimes tend to focus too much on the MBA. What would be your, your advice to a young kid sort of at, at 16, 16 age right now? Keep working. Understand that this this game can, you know, change generations for you. And and not only in the NBA, like this, this, this basketball can take you all over the world. Right. You know, if you handle your business, you stay on top of it. This basketball can take care of you and your family. I would tell them the whole college route, you know, it's changing now. So, you know, I, I'm not big, but if you do want to go to college, I would say get a meaningful degree. Like, don't go to college just to mm. just play basketball. Get something from that education. I wish I would have done that, you know, looking back, of course. Would have got yeah, some kinesiology or learn about the human anatomy. So when you go into, you know, God willing, you don't get these injuries. But when you do, they're not talking over your head. Right. That's Some a good point. Has to explain it. Right. Because, you know, we, we, we've been through some of the injuries I've had. You just be like, yeah, okay. That's okay. So this is what I need to do. All right, cool. Let me go do it. And not really know what's going on. I think that, that that that's important to, to really try to get educated on something, learn about this money, learn about different trades, different things that you're interested in, and then just do your work wherever it takes you, you know, continue to try to improve yourself. College isn't the end all be all, the NBA isn't the end all be all, and but just continue to work and time will tell. Right, that's a great point. Hey, Pay, something I like to ask all the players that we've had on here is do you feel like your additional interests off the court have helped make you a better player on the court and a better, well-rounded person? I would say more of just more of the well-rounded, being able to have a conversation with anybody, not just being all basketball all the time, which th that's fine too, you know, but being able to, to talk life, you just be able to walk down the street, sit at a coffee shop and just spark up a conversation about whatever. I, I think that that has helped me. As far as basketball, I, I don't think so. I mean, maybe it gives you more purpose, you can find purpose from, like, let's say, if you like to travel, your perspectives can change to, you know, thinking you have it bad. So when you go over to, you know, I'm Nigerian, I've been to Nigeria, you see how some how people are living there. You're like, nah, this thing, I don't have nothing right, bad. Right, right. Let, let me get myself together. That's, I guess that's the, that's the balance we're trying to find, right, is uh, how, much, how much do you focus on the sport and getting the most out of the sport, and then how much do you focus on these other aspects of your life? Because you know, one of the things I always have have said about particularly young guys that come in the NBA is they get taken advantage of because they're just not knowledgeable, right? They just don't have general knowledge about certain things, and people take advantage of them and make you know people latch on, take advantage, take things, and, and are in those relationships that aren't nourishing that player. And a lot of times that derails guys. So, you know, I've always tried to think about it, at least talk to young people about other aspects of their life to the degree that it doesn't, if you really want to get something out of this basketball, that it doesn't infringe or hurt basketball, but, but help and push you along further. 
you know what I'm saying, in basketball. Yeah, so. yeah, it's a big piece. To add to the 16-year-old, man, I tell him to get off of social media, man. Mm. Be able to be able to, to, you know, to get rid of the distractions, be able to be still. You know, like folks is telling on themselves, especially right now in quarantine. People are getting on lives and just saying anything. They don't know anything. Right? And they don't, they don't know, know nothing. They don't know nothing. Right. They they don't know like, nothing. Man, get off of social media, don't and what and, and focus on your path. Don't look left or right. You know, just yeah. focus on your path, get you a solid circle that you know going to ride for you and going to check you when you're wrong. There's a lot of guys nowadays, man, they, this generation is just, it's different. It's a little different. Now, how do you find that? How do you find that balance? Because in, in so, you know, one in one hand, you're saying find that circle, find the people that, you know, can help you make good decisions. But then you go to rookie transition and a lot of the messaging that may come from rookie transition is you got to cut the people off that were with you right, that come along with you on this journey. So where does a guy find that middle ground? It's a cold world, man. It, man, that's a, <laughs> I got to look at that program, man, because yeah. that, that message hasn't changed. And they got to stay true to themselves, man, really. Right. At the end of the day. But feels right. You know, you can hear all of that. And, and I would hope that they have elders in their lives that, that they've been able to get game from and they can continue to get game from. And sometimes you just got to go through life and you're going to take your bumps and bruises and you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to bounce back. And I just say stay true to it, man. That's, that's a good point, man. Because, you know, you see a lot of a lot of basketball players, they come up with one trainer throughout high school, then college, then they get to the NBA and you don't see those same people around them anymore. Right. You know, it, and I, it, it's it's unfortunate. I just say you gotta stick to the real. Stick stick to what you know. Stick to what has worked for you. You know, if right. you need help, you can always get that help. But don't don't go away. You know, don't go away from. It. I, you know, I, I I'm gonna email somebody from there, man, because I think now, especially now, especially kids who are coming from these communities that are disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. More than ever, I think all those players or whatever, whoever you are, you need to go back. Right. You need right. to go back and show them. Show them how you did it. Show them how you messed up. Show them that you ain't perfect or any of that. And, you know, and that's that's how you start building up communities. Absolutely. Well, I look, man, I've got, I've got a couple more questions. But I always like to ask guys about a moment in your life where you failed, but it, it, was an up, it was a fail up moment where somewhere in that basketball journey, things just didn't go the way you wanted, but that moment helped sort of spur you on to to something better so where was that moment for you one was john b line um i think okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, and, then, and then having to go to turkey and playing in the euro league and then taking it to another level winning the championship and all the success out there that was that, that, that was phenomenal right and what and what did you learn about yourself in in those in those moments i was stronger than i, than I knew i was and during that time i was able to go back home to Nigeria, and so mm -hmm. my perspective began to change again. But just, just I was tougher, tougher than I knew I was. And then I, I, I was proud of myself to be able to leave, you know, leave the country, leave the family, sacrifice, you know, just to provide, you know, for myself and my loved ones. Nice. And then my last one is your morning routine. What what do you do? What do you do in the morning, man? That um sort of helps you get started, get your get your perspective in the right right way to to face a day. Pray. I wake up, brush my teeth, of course, do whatever I got to do. Then I, you know, get on my knees and I pray. Yeah. So, you know, God to set up the day. You know, I walk in his will. Absolutely. This might be a little bit different of a question for you, but what are you most looking forward to doing when appropriately the restrictions on people have been lifted? <laughs> Wait, man, this is, I think this is the new normal. I think, I, I, don't, I don't know how much these restrictions are going to get lifted. I would like to travel again, you know, I, of course. I would like to go to, to see the Machu Picchu. Definitely want to go see that when I get a chance and then visit Jamaica if mm -hmm. we get a chance. Yeah. Right. right. And get the whole experience. Not, you know, not, not everybody wearing masks and such. Right, right. Well, we may be dealing with, this may, like you said, this may be our new, our new normal. We haven't quite, over here in the States right now, we're, we're uh yeah they're just struggling yeah they struggle man these folks are just doing as they please and um 
we'll see. You know, we'll see what 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 comes of this on the other side. But man, I'm 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 so thankful that you joined us, man. We know it's been a whirlwind, you know, and I appreciate the time, man. Like I said, I I appreciate you from afar, man. Just so you know that, man. I've always respected you, and once I once I find guys that think and kind of you know use their whole capacity, man. I always become a fan. So I'm rooting for you, man, and uh, wish you the best as you continue your basketball journey, man. For sure. Appreciate that, man. Thanks again, man. I appreciate y'all. I appreciate you as well. You definitely look slim. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, man. I don't, have to, I don't have to carry all that weight. I don't need that 265 no more, man. I don't need it. I don't need it, man. All right, okay. Thank you. All right. We appreciate, appreciate it, man. It, man. Thank you. Thank you.